Our text this morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 64, this very first verse. Oh, that you would burst forth from the heavens, or another way to say, oh, that you would tear open the heavens, or that you would rend the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence as fire causes wood to burn and water to boil. Your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. Let us pray. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. For you are indeed our strength, our rock, and our only redeemer. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, one of the things, a great things to do if we're going to be looking at a Bible, really anything that we read, and we a lot of times we'll just do this kind of naturally, is that we understand the underlying assumptions that are taking place. Now, that's really important when we're starting to look at the Bible. So biblical interpretation, and what I would call accurate or good biblical interpretation, uh, is always mindful of these assumptions, underlying assumptions, the context. What bad interpretation does is it just takes the words and applies them willy-nilly wherever they want. And so it's, let's say, wrenching it out of context. But also, look, let's look and understand what is the underlying assumption. And so the first thing we see about this is this notion that this cry of deliverance, as I like to call it, this opening word, the cry of deliverance. Oh, that you would rend the heavens or tear open the heavens or uh, burst forth from the heavens and come down. Well, why do we want that? And the reason is because there's a discontinuity between heaven and earth. Things are not the way they are in heaven. And so what, what happens when we pray? Um, we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's not being done on earth as it is in heaven. You wouldn't pray for that if it was already taking place. The problem is, God's will is not being done on earth as God's will is done in heaven. And so we want to bring those together. So in a nutshell, that's the project, the biblical project that's going on. What God is doing is bringing that reality to pass, that his will shall be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. <clears throat> because the sober realization that the Bible gives us is that the world is not as it should be. That there has to be change. There has to be redemption. The word means to buy back. God wants to buy back the world from where it's going to the way God wants it to be. We also use the word deliverance or salvation. Salvation implies wholeness. And in all of that, we have to have the forgiveness of sins because that's what's causing the world to careen out of control. So it's a problem of sin. Now, we often think of sin as, I, I told a lie uh, to somebody that I love, so therefore I have sin. And that's true, that is a sin. But sin is more pervasive than that and more ubiquitous. It infects everything that we do so that every institution, everything in our lives, everything about us has the tinge of sin in it. And that's what the Calvinists so accurately and powerfully describe, even though, I mean, I really think it's kind of common uh, understanding among Christian orthodoxy, which is total depravity. As I like to say, I believe in total depravity, and sometimes I prove it. Prove it by the way I live my what life, by the things I say, because or lack of what I do. You, you, you notice in the prayer of confession, I, you know, sometimes we'll say, you know, I confess the things that I have done and the things that I have left undone, or what I have failed to do. Because the standard is not just, well, I didn't hurt anybody, but did you help anybody? When somebody's there and you could have provided help, did you do it? That's equally simple. So as we start looking at this, as we look at this world and apply that standard, we say, well, things are not as they should be. Now, Paul does this wonderfully in Romans. He just, Paul's magnificent in his writing, but in particular in Romans chapter 1. We, he sets out on a discourse about the status of the world. And I can just see the Roman readers, as they're looking at this first chapter, actually probably listening to it, and it's being read, and they're going, oh yeah, preach it, buddy. Because what Paul is telling is about how bad the world is around them. And I, in fact, he goes, well, you know, some of you are idolaters, or fornicators, or um, all kinds of things, or disobey your parents, goes kind of through the list of the, of the Ten Commandments, you know, listing all those things. 
And then he says, but you know what? They were, they're so bent on evil, and they're not satisfied with the bad stuff that they could do. They invent ways of doing evil. And I can just see everybody going, you, you, that, that, that's right. I, in fact, I can tell you some stories, because you should see what my neighbors do. And some of my friends, they're bad. And you're going to see, they're going to be like a gossip session going, let's talk about it. It'll be like one-upping and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can imagine that they're just listening to that, and that's racing through their mind. And then we get to chapter 2, and Paul says, oh, guess what, by the way? You're the same way. What? Yeah, you're the same. Uh, you have the law. You have the instruction. These people, they don't have a clue what's going on. They're living in darkness. In fact, in Romans 1, it says, you know, if... if They've been given, God has given them, them over to a depraved mind. As they have built their idols and gone about their way, and just says, okay, we'll go your own way. And it's just careening out of control. So they don't have a clue. But to these people, and he, and he says to Jews, because that's what he would have understood. And he would say, the Jews, you've been given the law, the patriarchs, the prophets. You should know, you should know the score. Oh, we, 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 we do know the score. We know what's up. Then why don't you do it? That's the point. Why don't you do it? <laughs> oh, okay. And then by chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's in that context. When we know how bad the people are around us, then we look in the mirror and say, Oh, oh I'm right there with them. Jesus gave a wonderful parable, you may remember the story, where he talks about two sons. Father says, hey, listen, I got a task for you to do. Go out there and do it. And the first son says, no way, I don't want to do it. I've had enough, but I'm not doing it. And he says to the second son, would you please go do this? The second son says, oh, sure, I'll do it. Except it kind of gets reversed because the first son goes, oh, yeah, I don't know why I said that. I'm going to go do it. So he goes and he does it. No way, fair. The second son says, and I, you know, I mean, you can do it. It's a parable, so you can do it. But I can almost imagine the second son going, yeah, I got every intention of doing it. And it really doesn't get done. So the simple question Jesus asked is, well, who did, the, who did the will of the Father? And of course, you know, you really have to answer, of course, it's the first one. He said he was going to do it, but he did it. That's at the end of the day all that matters. Did you do it? So, okay, yeah, he did it. And so, in a way, that's what, what Paul is saying here. It, it doesn't do any good for you to say, as the people did in Exodus 19, there's this wonderful passage, now we're going to, you know, and, and they say, everything the Lord says we're going to do. That's Exodus 19. In a few short chapters, they're going to build a calf and worship it and say that these are the gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Yeah, right. Okay. Their intentions are good. They've been given the instructions they don't follow. Imagine that people who have been given instructions don't follow them. I know it's never happened. Me. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's what they are, they're people, right? But you see, the whole point of this project is God wants to redeem the world. He wants to bring salvation to the world. He wants to bring his light and truth to the world. And he's going to work through this people. Oh, no, not this people. Yes. That's the way it is. God made his covenant with Abraham. He says, listen, all of you, I'm going to make a great nation. So numerous, the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. That's how great your descendants are going to be. And I'm going to give you a great land. You're going to be a great people because through you, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. And you got one thing to do. Listen to my voice. Follow my instructions. Love me with your whole heart, soul, and mind. Okay, sure, I'll do it. But they don't do it. Of course they don't do it. They're people. They're sinners. They're totally depraved, like all of us. So what happens is, God brings forth his judgment. It's kind of tells God all of this, but God brings forth his judgment. Now they go into exile in their battle on the temple's destroyed. Keep giving the temple his presence with them on earth. This is where the idea was the temple was heaven and earth meet there. And God's truth goes shining forth from there. And if you want to go meet God, you go to Zion, to the holy hill, to worship the Lord. And they don't really care about the temple. Now, occasionally there's somebody, you know, Josiah, the great king of, of Judah, he comes along, he says, he, 
There's another example. He rends his clothes and says, oh, no, we haven't been following this. And he institutes these reforms, and the temple gets shaped up, and he dies, and guess what happens? It goes right back to the way it was. So God says, okay, I'm bringing my judgment upon you. And the temple is destroyed, the people are carted off. Something really important happened there. And I won't go into it, but essentially, our, uh, we, we go back to this time. So if you say, what develops from there? It's when they went into uh, exile in Babylon. Because that's when we got the Bible. Now, I think the antecedents of the Bible were there. Documents were there. But they're in Babylon now. They don't have it anywhere around. It's not there around them. They figure, we better do this. And so they put it together as a book. First time in human history, among any other people, that a book like this was put together. The story of how, how God was working through them, God's instructions to them about what they were to be and what they were to do. And then they said, if we're going to be faithful, we, we can't go to the temple. Do we go to, there's no temple there. So we've got to follow the book. We've got to follow the book. We've got to follow the words. And so they became the people of the book. You know, they were pretty bad about idolatry when they were in Judah and Israel, when they were in the land. When they, when they came out of Babylon, they were fierce monotheists. You know, I, I, not to say that nobody ever caved in or whatever, but that became their identifying mark. The Romans, you've heard me say this before, but the Romans were so convinced that they couldn't reform the Jews that they said, okay, you don't have to worship the Roman gods. We'll give you an exemption. If you pray for Caesar, they pray for Caesar. Okay, that's fine. Because they know, they, they knew they could not get the Jews to worship an idol. Look at the book. If you look at the story, you find they're always, you know, before that, an idol goes by and they're going, they're better than the knee. Let's take one, might as well, you know, hedge our bets. We'll try everybody. After that, they're like, I'll never bow the knee to an idol. What happened? So think good things were happening. Another kind of interesting thing, they got so committed to observing the Sabbath that there was a time they were involved in a war and they decided we're not fighting on the Sabbath. And so the other people came in and slaughtered them because they would not violate the Sabbath. That's pretty hardcore, wouldn't you say? By the way, they had to figure out, well, you might want to rethink this. You know, only one slaughter and you're going to go, oh, maybe we should change our, our views of this a little bit. This, literally, this is all literally ha happened. So they become powerful because they become devoted. That's what it's supposed to be. But of course, it's not complete, as we know from Jesus. It kind of sets it all up. But that's what's going on. They're trying to do this to make this in the world. And what Isaiah is saying now that they've come back, and he's, this is a, 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 the prophecy that takes place after they have returned, right? And they say, but you know, it's not good enough. God is good. It's not going to work. This project of us working through us to change the world is not going to work. Oh, that he would rend the heavens and come down that the nations would quake at your presence, like the mountains would quake at your presence when you come down. That your, your, your refining fire, that's what he's talking about, this fire that causes wood to be burned and water to be boiled, that they would tremble at your presence because the holy God is in our midst, trampling down the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And that the great hand of the battle of the Republic. That notion of God coming forth with a refining fire and judgment. Oh, come down. And then the end result would be make everything new. That's what's going on. So we want God to intervene. We want God to come. Now, of course, we're reading this again as we know more of the story. And you can't help but look and say, why is, this on, why is this the text for the first Sunday in Advent? Because Advent is about coming. It's about God coming in the person of Jesus. But not only coming once, but coming twice. How do we look at that? How is that, how is that understood? Now, what you would imagine, by the way, C.S. Lewis said this, one of the things that he loves about the gospel, Lewis said, is that it goes against what we would imagine. So we wouldn't invent this. And the example of this. Because when we say, oh God, come down, I understand that's a human cry for deliverance, right? We want God to come. Well, how do we want him to come? Riding a stallion with a big sword. So that all the nations will tremble at his coming, right? So that he would be, yes, yes, he's coming, and he's got his legions with him, and he's going to make a difference. As we, you may recall, Jesus on the cross. So 
Because, you know, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. Even Jesus says, I could call down legions of angels to save me. But it's not about that. There's something else going on. That's the way we want him to come. But he doesn't come that way. Incredibly, he comes as a child, as a baby. That's not the way he's supposed to come. It doesn't work. And then he comes, and in the liturgy it says, he chose as his lot the poor. So how does he identify with the poor? He's a peasant. I remember years and years ago, I did a, interestingly enough, because of the news recently, but uh, Harry was born, Prince Harry, to um, Diana and uh, Charles, right? And so they, the word went forth from the castle. I'm sorry, it was William. I, I spoke to you soon. It was William. William was born. And the word from the castle was, he is not to be called Billy. <laughs> and it was about Christmas time, and I was thinking, oh yeah, how interesting. You know, we're, we're to call this one Jesus. Or I guess we weren't supposed to give him a nickname. But who paid attention? There was no royal announcement that anybody paid any attention to. The announcement came to shepherds in the fields nearby. This is not the way it's supposed to work. If you're going to wear the purple, that's a sign of Roman royalty, right? That's another euphemism for saying you're the king, you're the emperor, if you wear the purple. And Jesus was the one who was wearing the purple. But at least somebody should have noticed. It doesn't come that way. He comes, really, incognito. He comes as one of us, really like one of us. I was listening to somebody talk about Hinduism, you know, and about reincarnation. And of course, everybody thinks they're going to get reincarnated as a great king or something, right? This is what you probably would be reincarnated as a farmer. And then your next life would be as a farmer. And then your next life would be as a farmer, as a farmer. So you just keep going on. Because that's the way human, that's what it's been in human history. There's been like three kings and 10 million, 5 million, whatever it is, farmers. Because that's the way it works. And that's the way Jesus came. Not as Caesar's heir or something like that. He came as a peasant, as a carpenter. Carpenter's son. And then he gives us images of the kingdom. Notice the images that he gives us the kingdom. It's not strength and might. It's humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes out and proves it. He says, let the little children come to me, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he welcomes them and he blesses them, so that what he is showing in his kingship is that he's about children, women. Not power and might and strength, but love and mercy and servanthood, service to others in humility. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to know what it means to be great, you become the slave of all. You want to know what it means to come first, you become last. What is that? That's the coming of the kingdom. In the year 313, there was a fellow by the name of Constantine. He's a Roman emperor. He was fighting against. Uh, another Roman, uh, one who desired to be an emperor, and they fought at the Milvian Bridge. And the night before the fight, Constantine had a dream. And in the dream, he saw what we now call the Cairo Christogram, which is the Cairo, which is the Greek letter Chi and the Greek, Greek letter Rho. It looks like X and P, and the X is superimposed on the P. But those are the first two Greek letters, Cairo of Christ, or Christus. And it says, in this sign, conquer. So he goes out to fight. And he had to, and he, so the story goes, he had it put on the shields. And he goes out to fight. And he wins. Wins the big battle. Now, so that's the beginning of what we call Christendom. Now before that, the church had been underground. <laughs> and they had to do things like, you know, help people, love people. Well, now we got the support of the state. And in some ways, it was the worst thing that ever happened in Christianity. Because Christendom is a mixed blessing. You get an endorsement but an approval, but you lose the focus of what you're going to be about. But it's antithetical, isn't it? Sword, a shield, a sword to take the message of the gospel to the world. 
take a look. You take acts of love and kindness and mercy. That's what you take into the world to make a difference. That's why Jesus comes. And that's the way he will come again. But at his second coming, the world will acknowledge that his way is the true way. I mean, he's not going to change his way. He's still going to be about love and servanthood and grace and mercy and forgiveness. In the book of Revelation, the writer sees that the heavens are open, and he peers into, he says, I saw heaven open, and he sees, and guess who he sees on the throne, or attending to the throne? A lamb that looks like it was slain. Now, Jesus is also called the Lion of Judah, but what he sees, the picture is of a lamb that looks like it was slain. That's the picture of the conquering king, of the one who is king of kings and lord of lords forever and ever. Hallelujah. What's the picture of a lamb that was slain? That's the message, and that's how he comes again. Out of love and grace and mercy, to transform the world from what it is to what it will be through Jesus Christ. And what Isaiah is saying here in this opening passage for us in Advent is, Oh Lord, tear open the heavens and come down! As, as we know from the rest of the story, the Lamb who was slain so that the world could have the forgiveness of sins and salvation and life in him. Not to coerce or force, to control, but to love. To love with the self-giving love of Christ forever. I was like to say, you know, I want you to picture what the king's going to be like. Imagine that everybody in the kingdom of God, that kingdom which is to come, that when Christ comes down and establishes his kingdom, that everyone in that kingdom will be like Jesus. That everyone will consider others more highly than themselves, just as Jesus told us to do, showed us what to do, and empowers us to do by the Spirit. All of our problems disappear, because that is the perfection. And so with Isaiah, we cry, cry out, Oh, Lord, tear up the heavens, come down. Bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful love, your incredible grace, and our glory, Savior Jesus. The Lamb that was slain, but it is the great King. Tear up in the heavens and come down, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and affirm our faith in the recitation of the Nicene Creed. Let us confess the faith of the one holy, Catholic, and his universal and apostolic church. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. This kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, now for the prayers of the people. I, I should, I, we're doing our liturgy just a little different. So. Um, We'll see that when we get to it, but we'll start now with the prayers of the people. Are there any prayer requests that need to be made? Yes, Heidi? Um, prayers for my boss's family, um, the sister uh, contracted COVID, 
and died from fluid on the heart. Okay. And now the mother is 91, tested positive, and the brother. Okay, so pray for the okay. family with COVID. Yes, and also uh, my friend Jason, who is dealing with cancer. Okay, pray for Jason with cancer. Anybody else? Yes. My friend had dust, uh, was taking the burns from last night. I do not know the reasons, but he was taking burns from last night and they kept him. So I and who's that? Ed. Ed. Pray for Ed, who's in the hospital for these days. Okay. Yes. Pray for my granddaughter, Stacy, who's slowly recovering from back surgery. Okay. Stacy, did you say? And then. Oh, uh, for Kathy Roselle? Yes. Um, Kathy Roselle is in the hospital. She had. Um, she has internal acute hemorrhaging, internal hemorrhaging, they think from an ulcerated esophagus. Um, and so, of course, you know, Jim, Jim can't visit her, so there's a bunch of issues, so we'll pray for that. And he's gonna let me know if there's any um, change and I haven't heard anything yet. Yes, Ron. Um, the schools are closed till the end of the year, uh -huh. uh, which puts a lot of uh, difficulties in the life of families, so prayers for that. Um, also, I've got some big decisions to make regarding my ex with some ongoing legal stuff, so just some wisdom. Okay. Pray for Rhonda, and also for all of the families that are dealing with COVID as related to school, of course. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so let's try to get in the prayers of the people. Watching and waiting for the coming of Christ, we pray for the promise of new creation, saying, Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the church. We pray that uh, God's reign of love would shape us as a master of potter skillfully forms a vessel, that we may reveal your beauty to the world. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the world. Draw near to those who wait for you, O Lord. Break into their circumstances with blessing. Heal the earth that awaits your restoration. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for this community. And of course, now I'm really thinking of uh, what Rhonda was saying about the schools and all the stuff that's going on and how families and you know, workers and everybody has to deal with this. Transform the places in which we live. Grant that the gifts you have given all of us may be used for the common good. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for loved ones. And of course, we pray for all those that we've just named and here, um, starting with COVID or hospitalization for Kathy, um, for, oh, I meant also mentioned Lynn and Shirley. Uh, Shirley's in the hospital um, for, um, all the persons that we mentioned. Comfort all who suffer and despair. Assure them of your presence and care. Let your face shine and save us. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. O oh God, our hope, as the promised day approaches, fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit and strengthen us to serve you faithfully through Christ, who is coming to reign. Amen. Amen. Let's turn together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearance. Therefore, we pray to you, joining our voices uh, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing to this hymn to proclaim the glory of your most holy name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen to sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, and then to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross, 
and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, this blood, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, that they may be <clears throat> for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with your saints, with all your saints, into the joy and power of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. If you take the bread, friends, this bread has been blessed and so has become for us by faith the body of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you, or broken in death for our sake. Take and eat and remember that Christ died for you and be thankful. And the cup? The cup has been blessed and so has become for us the blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and remember that Christ died for you and be thankful. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart to Christ the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the triumph name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.